Okay. Welcome everybody uh, to the Worldwide Neuro Seminars in Addiction. And we're very lucky today to have Mary Kay Lobo as our speaker, and she will be introduced by Sema Kadir. So Sema, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Marina. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Kay Lobo for today's talk. She did her undergrad at UCLA and stayed there for her PhD, working with Dr. William Yang, examining striatal projection subtypes in direct and indirect pathways. She then moved to UT uh, Southwestern to work with Eric Nestler, looking at striatal neurons in addiction, eventually moving with his lab to Mount Sinai. In 2011, she joined the faculty at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and she is now a professor in anatomy and neurobiology, while also acting as co-director of the Center for Substance Use and Pregnancy. Uh, her CV was very amazing to read, mainly for like a couple of reasons. And the first is that she received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engagement um, from the Obama administration, which is something that I've never even heard of anyone doing, let alone an addiction researcher. But I think what really um, stood out to me the most is how much she, service she's really contributed to the scientific community at large. She's not just someone who helps review papers, which she does for over 30 journals, but she's sitting on the editorial board of so many journals. and. She contributes so much in terms of mentoring as well. So with that, I will give it away to Mary Kay and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction, Shima, Sema, sorry. Um, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the seminar series. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about um, work in my lab, um, including work focused on mitochondrial mechanisms um, and psychostimulant opioid action. So um, like many labs studying substance use disorders, um, I'm, I'm really interested in motivation, um, right? We all engage in motivational behaviors um, to, um, you know, for social interaction, for romantic relationships, to eat, which is essential for our survival, to do well in school, for hobbies, for sports. Um, but I'm really particularly interested in how these um, behaviors can go awry, especially in um, disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders, um, including substance use disorder or depression, where you can have negative affective states um, that, um, that kind of hijack your reward system. Um, and especially with, with um, misused drugs, you can have these, you know, you could, people can be taking drugs, um, um, they could stop taking drugs, but then they can have these negative effective states, which leads eventually to them relapsing and taking more drugs. So I'm really interested in um, trying to understand the neurobiological mechanisms occurring um, in these disorders. Um, and like many labs studying the, um, studying addiction or, or other, other motivational behaviors, um, we focus on the reward and basal ganglia circuitry. We know that this, this, these circuits are critical for motivation for natural rewards. They, we know they become um, disrupted in substance use disorders, so motivation is geared toward a seeking drug. And we know, also know they become altered in mood disorders characterized by anhedonia and reduced motivation. Um, we've really been focusing on the, the striatum, the ventral striatum, nucleus cummins, and different cell subtypes there um, that receive um, inputs from many glutamatergic regions, dopamine re regions, and send outputs throughout the brain, including the ventral pallidum and back to midbrain. Um, and we've really been focused on the projection neurons. So a lot of the work I'll tell you on, we'll, um, I'll talk about, will be focused mainly on these, these two main projection neurons in the um, striatum, specifically the nucleus accumbens. Um, these two neurons are heterogeneously intermixed um, in this region. And they send outputs to various different regions, um, including to midbrain, uh, but also to ventral pallidum. They both project um, pretty densely to ventral pallidum. Um, and as many as you know, these projection neuron subtypes are um, known as medium spiny neurons, also known as spiny projection neurons. And they come in these two subtypes, which are um, differentiated by their projections, but also by their enrichment of different um, genes, including dopamine receptors. So in our lab, we just often call them D1 or D2 MSNs. We know that they're enriched in other G, G protein coupled receptors like muscarinic M4, A2A, GPR6, as well as neuropeptides, dynorphin, substance P, and a kephalin, and a number of other molecules that myself and others have found by um, isolating these two, two neurons and doing gene expression profiling. There's been a, quite a lot of work um, on these neurons from many people, um, really showing these kind of dichotomous roles for these neurons in response to psychostimulants, but also motor behavior, reinforcement, aversion, 
Um, and again, you kind of get these oftentimes opposing roles, but that's not always the case. It can be stimulus specific, region specific, or projection specific. And you have situations where these D1 neurons, you know, when they're active, they're thought to promote reward, motivation, but you have um, situations where they can actually regulate avoidance or reduce consumption. And these D2 neurons, you have um, situations where they can actually regulate motivation. Um, so my lab is also really interested in um, molecular adaptations to the brain that um, occur with these long-term, um, uh, these, 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 these can be long-term adaptations that occur with drug exposure. Um, we have, you can have um, molecular changes um, at the level of chromatin, transcription, and ultimately these can lead to um, changes um, in synaptic and structural plasticity and circuit adaptation. So we're really interested in trying to understand molecular changes and how they might lead to these adaptations in these specific cell subtypes. Um, but where do mitochondria fit in? I told you I'm gonna to talk to you about mitochondria today. Um, and I'll be upfront, when I started my lab 10 years ago, I never imagined I'd be working on mitochondria. I did not have any intention of working on mitochondria. In fact, if there was an organelle I didn't really like, it was probably mitochondria, because it just reminded me all these different pathways. You'd have to memorize Krebs cycle and all those when you're in high school, biology or um, undergrad biochem. So I actually didn't like mitochondria. But since then, I've actually found out mitochondria are very cool. Um, they can play a role in regulating synaptic plasticity, they can play a role in regulating synaptic transmission. There's also um, cannabinoid receptors in mitochondria, and um, cannabinoids can regulate metabolic processes in mitochondria. And mitochondria actually have their own um, DNA, so they have their own transcription, transcriptome, they have their own transcription factors, there's also non coding RNAs. And, and all of these processes have been explored in um, response to um, misused substances. So I think mitochondria are, are, are you know, there, there's, we, we should be looking at mitochondria and try to explore what their role in some of these processes in substance use disorder. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about today, I'll, I'll first talk about some of our work um, on cocaine um, and specifically in the, these D1 neuron subtypes. Um, um, and um, I'll give some information about um, um, some findings that we have about transcriptional regulation of mitochondrial mechanisms um, and then some of these downstream mechanisms. Um, that's work that was started by Ramesh Chandra in the lab, um, along with Michelle Engeln. Um, some work has been done by Shannon Cole. And then I'll talk a little bit about the end of what we're doing and trying to kind of get a global perspective of mitochondrial changes um, throughout the reward circuitry. And that's, um, I'll, I'll show a little bit of data um, from Kelly Calarco. Um, and then, um, and then I want to introduce um, this new paradigm we've been working on, this perinatal fentanyl exposure um, paradigm, um, and some studies where we've um, just beginning to look at mitochondria, really looking at, again, global changes in mitochondrial adaptations, but also mitochondria in the blood and the brain. And this perinatal fentanyl paradigm was really established by Jason Olipio, who's a graduate student at Soft Keller's lab, um, with help from Meg Fox in my lab, um, as well as Catherine Haga, another um, graduate student at the Keller lab, who also rotated in my lab and worked on this project. Um, and then now Jamil Sokin, a postdoc, has been looking at it, and, and also so some data from Cali looking at mitochondria in the blood. Um, so um, I just want to put up this graph. I think we've all seen this a lot recently, and really um, the focus has been on opioids. Um, but I'll get back to the opioids in the, the, the second part of the talk. I just want you to bring your attention here to this darker green line, which is cocaine. And you can see in the past few years that um, overdose um, due to cocaine is on the rise. So it's important that we're still looking at the effects of cocaine on the brain and neurobiological mechanisms. Um, because it, it is, there is relevance to human substance use disorder. Um, so how do we actually get into mitochondria? Well, we started through this transcription factor, early growth response three. My lab became interested in this transcription factor because it's downstream of both um, BDNF and dopamine signaling, um, and it can be regulated through these signaling pathways. It can be regulated by the transcription factor CREB, which has also been shown to be play a role in um, behavioral responses um, to misuse drugs. Um, so we started looking at EGR3 um, in the brain 
specifically in nucleus accumbens. Um, what we found previously, this has been published for a while now, is that EGR3 is reduced in nucleus accumbens when we give animal repeated um, injections of cocaine in like 24 hours after. We also see that it's also reduced um, in the um, nucleus accumbens after cocaine self-administration. This is in rats. This is from David Dietz's group. These rats are from David Dietz's group, SUNY Buffalo. And then we've, we've also looked specifically at these um, D1 and D2 neurons, we've looked at EGR3 levels here, um, because oftentimes, right, when we're, take, when we're taking the whole nucleus accumbens, we're getting, we're getting a, a mixture of different cell subtypes and non-neuronal cells, so we want to look specifically at these two neurons. And one way that we've been doing that in the lab is we've been using this ribotag approach, um, where we can tag ribosomes in these two population of neurons. We can immunoprecipitate down those tagged ribosomes and then isolate RNA um, from, um, from, from, from these um, ribosomes. So this is um, RNA that is um, likely undergoing translation because it's found on the ribosome. And what we found is um, at the same time point, this is from IP injections, we see that this reduction was occurring in the D2 MSNs, but we actually see the complete opposite, an induction in um, the D1 neurons. We get this opposite um, induction of EGR3 in response to cocaine. Um, we've since looked at a variety of behaviors. This is just showing a condition place preference where we've overexpressed EGR3 um, in D1 or D2 neurons, or we've, we've knocked it down with a microRNA. Uh, and basically, if we mimic the effects that we see in the D1 neurons, Neurons in these D1 neurons, we get an enhancement of place preference for cocaine. Um, and then when we do this overexpression deterrence, you get actually get a reduction to so get these opposing roles. And then the converse, when we knock it down, so we block the effects of cocaine in um, the D1 neurons, um, mimic the effects in D2 neurons, you get a reduction in place preference through these D1 neurons, enhancement through the D2 neurons. Um, we've since looked at um, EGR3 at prolonged absent time points, and this is using um, cocaine self-administration. Our lab, the, the previous data um, I showed you was um, condition place preference. Our lab has now has shifted to more self-administration paradigms. Um, and what we've done is we um, to actually use both rats and mice, um, and we've, um, um, and the rats are, from, again, from David Dietz's lab. We put them through 10 days of self-administration and then um, um, put them through 20 days of forced abstinence and then collected tissue here. Um, and what we actually found was pretty interesting. We actually found um, a sex-specific effect where EGR3 um, is only reduced in females at that prolonged abstinence time point, but not in males that self-administer cocaine in both rats and mice. Um, so because previously we had seen this effect in the D2 neurons, we went on and explored this in the D2 neurons. Um, we are now using the A2A cream mice. Um, previously we used the D2 cream mice, but um, D2s express in cholinergic interneurons. The A2As are a little more specific to these D2 MSNs. So what we did is we put the animals through 10 days of cocaine self-administration. Um, and after that last day, we, we injected the virus, so EGR3 overexpression, because we saw it reduced in the females um, into the A2A3 um, mice, the nucleus accumbens, um, so we can overexpress in D2 neurons. Um, and then we waited um, um, 20 days and then put them through a cocaine seeking paradigm and then looked at um, very, you know, different extinction sessions after that and then put them through a drug induced reinstatement um, um, behavior. So you can see here, this is before they're getting virus. You can see both our cocaine, EGR, the, the animals that will later get um, EGR3 or EYFP, the cocaine groups are both um, self-administering cocaine compared to saline, both males and females. Um, when we look at seeking behavior, when, when the, drug, when the um, virus is on board, we're actually not seeing a difference between the animals that receive the EYFP control versus EGR3 and the males or the females. However, when we look at subsequent extinction sessions, we are seeing effects there. What we see is if you just compare males and females, look at the cocaine EYFP group, you see that um, males are actually extinguishing much more rapidly than the females. However, when we overexpress EGR3 in these D2 neurons, we actually um, can prevent that rapid extinction. Um, and we see the opposite effect in females, we actually cause a more rapid extinction when we overexpress EGR3 in the D2 neurons. Um, and then when we do this drug induced reinstatement, if you just compare males and females, we actually don't see with this, this dose of cocaine, we don't, we've never really seen a drug induced reinstatement in males, but we do see this in females. 
Um, however, when we overexpress EGR3, we can actually um, cause a drug-induced reinstatement um, in the males. And we see the opposite. We can blunt this in the females. So again, we get this opposite response where um, if we overexpress EGR3 in these D2 neurons, we can blunt responses in the females and we can enhance responses to cocaine in the males. Okay, so I showed you all this data on EGR3, but what about mitochondria? So where does where do how do we how do we find out about my, mitochondria through EGR3? Well, the big question really was. What is EGR3 targeting, right? It's a transcription factor. I mean, what so what is it targeting that might play a role in um, cellular changes and ultimately circuit changes and ultimately behavioral changes? Um, so we have some evidence that it um, targets, uh, it may target trans trans transcriptionally target other transcription factors or co-activators that have previously been shown to play a role in behavioral responses to cocaine. Um, turns out there's also a lot of EGR3 binding sites on histone methylation and methylation enzymes, um, which we also know play um, a response and, and a role in response to cocaine. Um, and then we found this new class of genes, which are mitochondrial nuclear genes. So what are mitochondrial nuclear genes? Well, they're just genes that are um, found in the nucleus, transcribed in the nucleus, but they're proteins that then go into the mitochondria to play a role in mitochondrial function. Um, so not to be confused with mitochondrial genes, which are found in the mitochondria. Um, so we wanted to explore this further. Um, so here is um, an illustration of different um, genes that have mitochondrial, um, that have EGR3 binding sites on them. Um, some are other transcriptional factors or transcriptional co-activators like NRF1, NRF2, um, PGC1-alpha, this molecule PGC1-alpha um, has um, um, been shown to play, it's a, a transcriptional co-actor, has been shown to regulate a number of mitochondrial related molecules, including molecules involved with mitochondrial biogenesis and dynamics. Um, we found EGR3 binding sites on some mitochondrial transcription factors because mitochondria, again, they have their own DNA, they have their own transcription. So these transcription factors, TFAM, TFB1, um, this Paul G is the catalytic subunit for the mitochondrial DNA polymerase. TOM20 is a mitochondrial import receptor. And DRP1 is a molecule that's involved in mitochondrial fission or division. Um, so what we did is we did chromatin immunoprecipitation um, using EGR3 antibodies to look at um, um, EGR3 binding to promoters of these genes after exposure to cocaine. We did this again just with acute or with um, IP injections of cocaine to the tissue 24 hours later. And what we did find is that there is an increase um, on, on promoters of some of these genes, including DRP1, the fission molecule, um, NRF2, Paul G. And previously, we published a paper where we showed increased binding on PGC1 alpha. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the data. We've looked at all these um, molecules, um, mainly mRNA expression, sometimes protein expression. Uh, but here is a summary of all this data and various papers or in a preprint. Um, and you see that sometimes we're not seeing things change, um, um, in the, and especially with, um, with um, whole tissue, um, because again, we're getting a mixture of cells there, but we have looked at whole nucleus accumbens and um, post-mortem tissue um, from humans that were dependent on cocaine um, and, and um, um, nucleus accumbens from rats that self-administer cocaine and from nucleus accumbens of mice that received IP injected cocaine. And you see, even though like sometimes we're not seeing changes, we do see in all cases an increase in the, these mitochondrial related molecules. Interesting though, EGR3, when we look at whole tissue, it's always reduced. Um, and then when we look at the Z1 and D2 MSNs using this ribotag procedure, what we're finding is um, in the D1 MSNs, these molecules are always increased, including um, EGR3 and the D2 neurons that are actually reduced. So we're getting this opposing role of um, opposing induction of these um, some of these molecules in the D1 and D2 neurons. And it also follows the same induction pattern as EGR3. Um, consistently, we've seen changes of D in DRP1, this fission molecule. It's increased in um, postmortem tissue of um, human cocaine dependence and rats to self-administer cocaine um, in, in, the, in mice that received IP injections and also in the D1 neurons and reduced in the D2 neurons. Um, so what is mitochondrial fission? Um, well, well, mitochondria can undergo these dynamic processes where they can either fuse together to form new mitochondria or divide to, to um, 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 also form new mitochondria. 
Um, and these are the molecules that play a role in this. Um, so DRP1 can actually bind to the outer, outer mitochondrial membrane and play a role in that division. Um, why, do, why do mitochondria do this? So they, they, they do this to kind of regulate metabolic processes. And really, they're still, we're still trying to understand these processes, especially in neurons. One thing we know is that um, mitochondrial fission and DRP1 actually mediate um, neuronal plasticity. Here's an example um, from Sai Divakaruni. He was an MD PhD student in Tom Blanfield's lab in my university. Um, it turned out Sai um, and Tom were actually, we found out that Sai and Tom were actually also exploring this project on DRP1 at uh, the same time that my lab was. We were able to give them some vectors um, to look at um, DRP1. Um, and what's really been shown in the literature as DRP1 and fission can mediate, um, you know, structural changes in neurons, um, increase um, um, spines in neurons. And what um, Sai showed is that if you give um, a chemical LTP, what you see is you get um, this growth of spines. But if you use a dominant negative DRP1, you can block this. And through a series of very elegant experience, uh, experiments, um, Sai really showed a role for DRP1 and other molecules, including DIN2 which plays a role in fission and um, actin and CAMK2 in regulating mitochondrial fission. Um, um, they also showed importantly, because you think of mitochondria as producing ATP, but they also play a really important role in just calcium homeostasis. So they showed that calcium homeostasis was really, or calcium, um, uh, mitochondrial calcium influx is really important in this process to ultimately lead to LTP expression at the level, um, at the physio physiology and structural level. And again, other studies have really shown a role for DRP1 and mitochondrial fission and synapse development, um, synapse structure, um, so this really seemed uh, a, a good molecule to pursue because we know you have a lot of plasticity changes um, in these D1 neurons in response to cocaine. Um, so one important thing that I wanted to look at is to make sure is um, is this activated version, this fission promoting version of DRP1, that's phospho DRP1 serine 616, is this change in the nucleus accumbens? And we do see after repeated cocaine that it's increased. Um, I showed you on that summary slide, we saw this um, induction of um, um, DRP1 in the D1 neurons, which I'm showing you here, and a reduction in the D2 neurons using this ribotag approach after repeated cocaine. Um, and then we actually were able to do um, immunostaining and look at this phosphorylated version and do see a slight increase um, in D1 neurons, in co-localization D1 neurons, and decrease in D2 neurons, again, after repeated cocaine. Um, so because we saw the changes in DRP1, um, we wanted to then look at the morphology of this mitochondria. And we can, this is really nice because we can look at, just look at the morphology in a cell type specific manner using a Korean inducible mitoDS red vector injected into these D1 Korean animals. Um, we've also done this in D2 Korea. We're not really seeing much of a change. So I'm just going to focus on the, the um, D, D1 effect. Um, so we took animals that self-administer cocaine, and then we looked at the mitochondria. And you could see here in the, the cocaine group compared to the saline group, you just see a lot more of these fragmented or smaller mitochondria. That's illustrated here, this heat plot, where you can see the cooler colors are smaller mitochondria, and these, um, um, these red colors are, are longer mitochondria. When you quantify this across different areas of the dendrite, you do see an increase in frequency of these smaller size mitochondria in the cocaine group in D1 dendrites. Um, shown here, we also see um, a shift in length um, in the D1 dendrites um, to this smaller size and overall just a smaller size in mitochondria. So we, you know, this is indicative of fission, which makes sense because we see DRP1 increase in these neurons. Um, we've also manipulated DRP1. I'm not going to show all the data. This, this, this has been published for a while, uh, but we've used a microRNA to knock down DRP1. Um, it's in the Korean inducible vector. Here you can see we can knock down both total DRP1 as well as this um, fission promoting um, phosphorylated version. Um, we, we've given the virus um, before we start any behavior and the virus is on board, DRP1 is expressed or DRP1 is knocked down before we start behavior. What we find when we put them through just um, this cocaine self-administration, we really don't see a difference um, here in the, the, the group that got the scrambled control virus compared to the DRP1 knocked down the microRNA. However, when we put them back in the box 24 hours later, we do see this um, reduction of active responses in seeking out that nose poke where they were previously getting cocaine. 
And when we look at the mitochondria, we do see that this knockdown does cause more elongated mitochondria. So we're preventing these fragmented mitochondria, likely preventing fission. Um, so I, you know, I started out talking about um, the role of mitochondria in, in, in plasticity. So what what information do we have about um, plasticity in these neurons um, uh, um, via DRP1. So the information we have on this has um, um, been through using a small um, molecule MDIV1, which is thought to be an inhibitor of fission or even DRP1, although it's a little bit controversial in the field, can also affect other mitochondrial processes. In our hands, when we give a systemic injection of MDIV1, we, we do see this um, um, fission-promoting phosphodRP1 is reduced in the nucleus accumbens. We've used this this, um, this um, agent in a number of behaviors. I'm just going to show you one example here, and this has been done in rats by David Dietz's group, where um, they put rats through self-administration, and in the last three days, they actually infused MDiv into the nucleus accumbens. Um, and what they find, they didn't see an effect during these last three days, but when they put them back in the box 24 hours, hours later, you see a reduction in these active responses. So they're not seeking out that um, cocaine nose poke um, as much um, as the animals that receive vehicles. So we're, again, we're bl blunting this cocaine seeking response. Um, but what about the effect of MDV on plasticity? Well, first, we just want to make sure, does MDV actually affect, if we showed um, phosphor drp ones reduced, does it affect um, a, you know, um, mitochondrial morphology? Um, and here is an example, we actually gave, again, repeated cocaine and looked at the D1 neurons afterwards. Here you can see the cocaine vehicle, you see this fragmented mitochondria, but with MDV, we're not seeing um, these fragmented mitochondria as much, we're seeing more elongated mitochondria. Um, and our one insight into plasticity came from recordings by Megan Creed, where she recorded from D1 neurons in animals that received um, repeated cocaine um, with either vehicle or MDV and then saline controls. And you can see that these D1 neurons have an enhancement of um, amped and MDA ratios um, in the cocaine vehicle group. However, the animals that received MDV were, 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 were blunting this mitochondrial fission process. Um, blunting this phosphor DRP1, we do get a reduction um, in these AMPA to MD ratios. Um, so that's our insight into plasticity, and that fits what's known about um, DRP1 and its role in plasticity. We're still looking at other mechanisms. We do have some preliminary data showing that this DRP1 knockdown can reduce spine formation in these D1 neurons, but this is still ongoing in the lab. Um, but back to EGR3, I started out with EGR3. That's what led us to kind of look at these mitochondrial processes. But if EGR3 is actually regulating these, you know, transcription of these mitochondrial nuclear genes, can it potentially be regulating these mitochondrial processes? Um, so we've looked at this more recently. Um, we've, um, what we've done is we've given animals um, either repeated cocaine or saline. Um, and then we've also knocked down EGR3 in the D1 neurons. And then we've collected um, mRNA from um, D1 neurons using this ribotac procedure. But then we've also looked at the mitochondria um, uh, um, of these D1 neurons um, in another set of group that got this knocked down. Um, so we looked at two molecules that we found consistently regulated, um, and that's um, DRP1 and PGC1 alpha. And what you see, um, and we've published this previously, is that um, cocaine, so the, the, the scramble group, this is the control group, the gray bars, you see that um, um, with repeated cocaine, you see this induction of both PGC1 and DRP1 um, in the cocaine group and D1 neurons. Um, however, when we're knocking down EGR3, which we showed combined promoters of both DRP1 and PGC1 alpha, we can block this induction. So here's the EGR3 cocaine group here in green. Um, so we're able to block the induction of these molecules by cocaine when we're knocking down EGR3. Um, we then um, use the same approach, use this knockdown. Um, and then looked at given animals repeated cocaine and then looked at the mitochondria. Um, and you can see here, here is the scrambled um, 
um, cocaine, um, you can see some fragmented mitochondria, but when you look at the easier three knockdown, it looks like they're longer. And this is quantified here in this 1.5 to 3 micron range. You can see, as you know, I showed you previously, with self-administration, we see this induction. So here's the, the scrambled micro microRNA saline group in this um, light gray bar. And you see this induction of smaller um, size mitochondria in the scrambled. Um, control um, microRNA um, cocaine group. So that's what we've seen um, consistently previously. However, the animals that receive the EGR3 knockdown, we get this, um, we blunt this um, increase in this smaller size mitochondria. Again, you can see that here. One interesting thing is when you look at the EGR3 knockdown in the saline group, it seems that we are getting smaller mitochondria and you actually see that there is um, a significant difference between the saline and the cocaine EGR3 knockdown. We're not really sure what's happening there, but we do see that when we knock down EGR3 and the cocaine, we can blunt the response compared to the control cocaine group. Um, so just to kind of summarize that part of the talk, um, we've sh I've shown you um, that we do see in these D1 neurons after early absence from repeated cocaine. And I will say that we've looked long term, we've looked at prolonged absence, we don't see these mitochondrial changes, at least in the D1 neurons, we haven't really probed them so much in the D2 neurons. But um, after early abstinence, um, we see this increase of DRP1, phospho DRP1, I didn't show you all the data because it's been published, we also see that DRP1 can play a role in just CFOS induction, in these D1 neurons, we see this increase in, it seems to be excitatory synaptic function. And then ultimately, we see these, right, we see this mitochondrial fission, increased fragmented mitochondria, and increase cocaine seeking behavior. Um, I've now shown you that this seems to be um, regulated through EGR3, regulating DRP1, um, um, and EGR3 can also directly um, or, or indirectly through possibly through DRP1 and, and um, regulate this fission process by cocaine. Um, I also showed you that EGR3 can regulate PGC1 alpha, which we're also interested in looking at because it is um, PGC1 alpha can, can regulate, is a transcriptional activator, and can regulate um, many of these mitochondrial dynamic molecules like DRP1. Um, and PGC1 alpha has been shown to play or also play a role like DRP1 increase um, synaptic plasticity. Um, we still have a lot of um, questions remaining. We were we want to we want to continue to pursue these mitochondrial mechanisms. You know, one question that we get asked a lot is what's 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 the upstream mechanisms that's regulating the process for these processes? And we really haven't looked at that, whether, you know, are there different excitatory inputs that regulate these mitochondrial processes? Are there different signaling processes? Uh, what other functional adaptations occur in D1 MSNs? I told you we do have some preliminary data suggesting that DRP1 may be re re regulating structural changes in these cells. We haven't looked at that thoroughly. And ultimately, how do these changes in these D1 neurons through mitochondria affect circuit connections? And then what about um, mitochondrial mechanisms um, and potential transcriptional mechanisms occurring with prolonged absent time points? We haven't really looked at this. We, as I said, we didn't see changes, at least in D1 neurons, but we, we haven't really looked further than that, especially because we saw this sex-specific effect through D2 neurons and DGR3. We're interested in looking at those prolonged time points. But the other thing we're interested in looking at is just are mitochondrial mechanisms altered across reward circuitry? Um, so how do we actually begin to look at these processes, right? And um, where do we even start? Um, what molecules should we look at? Um, well, one thing we can do is just take available data, especially RNA-seq data, and start to probe and see what are their mitochondria-related changes in RNA-seq data. And fortunately for us, um, there was this really nice paper from um, 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 Dina Walker, Hannah Cates, and Yang, Yang Weed Lo, um, um, with um, senior authors Ann Kalapari, Li Shen, and Eric Nessler, where they actually did this kind of global transcriptome analysis across brain reward circuits. Um, and they did this, they put animals through self-administration, they had a group where they collected 24 hours, which is a lot of data I've shown you. They also had a group where they looked um, 30 days out um, and also had given animals um, um, an additional injection of cocaine or saline at that time point. Um, and nicely, they did it across, as I mentioned, they did across multiple brain regions in the reward circuit, including the PFC, dorsal striatum, nucleus accumbens, um, basal lateral amygdala, ventral hippocampus, and VTA. Um, so we started to look at this data, and we've been mainly focused on this 24-hour um, time point. But when we were looking at this data, we felt there was one important brain region that was missing that my lab and others are studying, and that is the ventral pallidum. 
fortunately, our lab actually had already generated RNA-seq data from the ventral pallidum after cocaine self-administration. So we can also look in our data set at the ventral pallidum along with these other brain regions. Um, so, so this data is still kind of ongoing, and this, you know, this this data has been analyzed mainly by Kelly Clark with some help from Michelle Engel. Um, but I'm just going to show you a, a little bit of this data. Um, and this, there again, there's so much data. I'm not going to show everything, but I'm just listing some of the gene ontologies that are showing up um, in this data. And this is with, you know, cocaine um, self-administration and 24 hours abstinence where um, the tissue has been collected. Um, and really we're getting a lot of um, gene ontology um, terms with metabolic processes. Oops. Um, these show up a lot and there's different types of categories of metabolic processes. And when you look in those, you can find some mitochondrial related molecules. And you see this across all of these brain regions. Um, we also see some ATP binding, which could be related to mitochondria um, in, in the striatal regions, so the cummins, the striatum, as well as the PFC. We see NAD plus synthase activity, which again could be related to mitochondria in the BLA, um, oxygen and ROS metabolic processes, and then um, hippocampus. And then we do see a mitochondrial um, a, a specific mitochondrial member in part in the ventral pallet. Um, one interesting a point that I want to point out is that when we look, we haven't looked so much as this like prolonged time point, the 30 days, um, this data from, from the Nestor group, but we, we did look at um, a bit at this group that went underwent saline self-administration um, and then went through 30 days abstinence and then get, got other cocaine and saline injections. So these are really animals that were just exposed to cocaine once. And what's really interesting about this group is you do actually see a lot of gene ontology terms related to mitochondria, um, mitochondrion, mitophysian, organization, translation, and a membrane, envelope, et cetera. And where they're showing up only in these glutamatergic regions in PFC, BLA, and ventral hippocampus. So that was really interesting that you get these mito um, um, ontology related terms only in these glutamatergic regions with this one dose of cocaine. So, so that, that was interesting finding, but we haven't explored that much more. Um, but again, this is a lot of data. And one thing we've done is we just kind of put it together um, and looked for some, you know, one, um, well, you know, listed the number of mitoterms here across these different regions, um, grouping striatal ranges, regions together, listing the number of mute transcripts. And then one thing we're interested in is what are potential transcriptional regulators of potential mitochondrial processes, right? Because I previously showed you EGR3 can be a transcriptional regulator. Um, but we want to identify other potential trans transcriptional regulator. And we've uh, through um, through um, analysis, we, we have found that these are potential transcriptional regulators of these transcripts that are showing up in these mitochondrial related um, gene ontology groups. Um, and I'm not going to, again, this is a ton of data, but what I have done is kind of summarize um, some of these potential transcriptional regulators and list just some of the molecules across these different brain regions that are related to mitochondria. Um, for instance, in the nucleus accumbens, this IRF1 transcription factor can, um, there's binding sites on this molecule VIM, which um, plays a role in anchoring mitochondria to cytoplasm. Um, LAG3, which enhances mitobiogenesis, um, P2RX7, which is a mitoreceptor um, that modulates en energy metabolism, RIP-K2, which also regulate, which regulates mito mitophagy. I'm not going to go through all this data, but this is a way that we can kind of summarize and really come up with um, a list of candidate molecules and then go in and do a more specific profiling, um, perhaps using nanostring, prof uh, uh, nanostring panels. Um, looking at a wide range of mitomolecules and also do this in a more circuit and cell type specific manner. All this tissue is from whole tissue where it's just an intermix of different um, neurons and non-neuronal cells. What we can do is start to isolate, um, you know, cells that send inputs to nucleus accumbens or um, cells that receive uh, um, inputs from the nucleus accumbens and then go in and, and profile these, these molecular changes and get, just get a better global understanding of um, mitochondrial molecular changes and their transcriptional changes across these brain regions. Um, so this data is still ongoing, but in the um, last part of the talk, I want to focus on our work in opioids, specifically um, in a perinatal fentanyl um, paradigm we've um, established. Why do we want to look at this? Well, we know that opioid use disorder um, is is, has risen, you know, from the late 1990s to to the mid um, to um, 2014. It's risen um, four times. Um, we know that this can have serious cons consequences. There, you know, increased rate of um, undergoing pre premature birth, stillbirth, infant death. 
Um, you can have neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, you can have things like dec decreased birth weight and body size. And there could also be long-term effects, including disruption and stress reactivity, altered glucocorticoid levels, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and aggression, um, and also impaired censoring processing. Although it's important to note that these, you know, these behaviors, there could be other factors at play, um, like socioeconomic status, systemic racism. So it's hard to always parcel out if these effects are through opioids. But it's it's really important, especially now, because there is this huge opioid epidemic um, and that we're looking at all groups, including women that are pregnant, taking opioids. Um, back to this overdose um, chart, you can see that there's been a huge rise in um, death by opioids, and that's mainly through synthetic narcotics um, like fentanyl. And one reason could just be is because fentanyl is highly potent. It's um, 50 times more potent compared to heroin. I mean, it was so bad that um, in Baltimore itself, there were signs um, um, out um, saying, don't let fentanyl kill you, trying to educate the public about how dangerous it was and you know the high number of deaths. And you really just have to, um, you know, you, you, how, here, giving advice on how to stay, stay, stay alive from fentanyl. Um, so because fentanyl has um, been so widely used um, and is the leading cause of death, we decided to set up a perinatal fentanyl paradigm. And this was really driven by Jason Olipio um, in a soft colors lab. Um, and also with a lot of help from um, Make Fox and also um, um, Matt Roche's lab um, at University of Maryland College Park. So um, they participated in this first um, publication. And since then, Jason has had a follow-up um, publication that Meg also did a lot of work on as well as Catherine, another a graduate student at Soft Lab. Um, and, and in the lab, we've been using this paradigm where we give um, fentanyl in the drinking water or water control animals um, to pregnant dams um, as soon as conception happen, happens. And we uh, give it a dose of 10 micrograms per mil, and then they get it in their water until, until weaning. Um, until the animals are P21. So the animals are getting it in mutero, they're also getting it through the mother's milk, and eventually when they're they're a little older, if they're able to reach um, the, the um, they're able to reach the, the water spout, they can get it um, themselves through the drinking water. Um, and Jason, so in this original paper, we just used this dose. Since then Jason has done a really nice characteriz characterization at different doses, including one, 10 and 100 micrograms per mil of fentanyl. And you can see here that um, um, there he's, you know, we don't see a change in dam weight, we don't see a change on liquid consumed um, compared to um, vehicle water. We don't see a change in food consumed. But so the mothers are, are for the most part, um, you know, they have these, these um, they're, they're pretty similar to vehicles. When we look at maternal care, there's also no difference compared to vehicles when you compare all these different doses of um, um, fentanyl. Um, looking at things like licking, grooming, active nursing, et cetera. Um, also looking at just interactions, uh, other interactions with the pups, like sniff latency, um, pup retrieval, nest building, crouching. Again, these parameters are not changed in the fentanyl compared to vehicle. So we don't really see a change in maternal behavior. Um, um, Jason has, and Jason as well as Meg have also um, looked at the litter size. We do find that this is reduced across these different doses of fentanyl compared to vehicle, and also litter mortality rates are increased. And this is consistent with um, some, some human data. Um, also, what's interesting is males have reduced body weight at P21. Um, however, it's just seven. They actually increase at P35, but then they're pretty normal by P55, and no change in females. And then Jason has also looked at spontaneous somatic withdrawal. Um, and he does see, you know, as soon as the wean, he does see these, um, these um, withdrawal effects, which we expect after having, you know, um, being exposed to fentanyl so long. Um, and he sees them across all these different doses here. Um, so that, that's a paradigm we've been using. And again, in our lab, we've been using this, this middle dose, this middle range dose, 10 micrograms per mil. Um, what we've done, and this is, um, you know, some of this data is in the original paper, um, make Fox in the lab is really the one who's um, driven this project and started out this project in our lab. 
Um, but what we've done is we've, we put the animal suits paradigm and then um, at ad adolescence age, we looked at a variety of behaviors and including behaviors related to emotion and um, motivation because that's what we're really interested in things that potentially are really through reward circuitry. We've looked at things like social preference using the three chambers um, social preference test, um, looking at their interaction with a same sex conspecific. Um, we've looked at um, elevated plus maze, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a measure for um, anxiety-like behavior or novel, novel exploratory behavior, um, as well as the splash test. So the splash test is just um, spraying an animal with a um, sticky solution um, and looking at their time spent grooming. And that's thought to be a motivation for self-care. Um, so what Meg found when she looked at social preference, and this is grouping both males and females together, we do get a significant reduction, although you do see a range here. So it seems like we are getting some individual differences. And this is very similar to what we actually see after stress. So we are interested in looking at these different individual differences in these um, different perinatal fentanyl exposed mice. Um, when we look at elevated plus maze, we actually get sex specific effects where we see um, reduced time in these open arms in the males, but not the females, and, and similar in the open to close time ratio in the males, not the females. Um, whereas in the females, we're seeing um, specific effects in the splash test. We see this um, overall reduction in time spent grooming. Um, so we're seeing these sex specific effects, at least in these two kind of motivational or um, exploratory behaviors. Um, but um, you know, where do we go from there in terms of trying to understand molecular mechanisms? Well, we were able to, we actually had, um, we had banked a ton of tissue and came into some money during the pandemic. And ideally we'd like to go forward and do more cell type specific profiling, but since we have this money available, we had all this tissue available, we just did um, bulk tissue RNA-seq across these different reward brain regions, including the male prefrontal cortex, nucleus accumbens VTA. And we also took a couple of sensory regions because the soft lab is interested in that, including um, S1 and ventral basal thalamus. Um, and you can see here, if you compare males to females, this is actually prelimbic, so the PFC, VTA, nucleus accumbens, ventral basal thalamus, and S1. You see that there are many sex-specific changes um, or sex-specific genes changes um, in males compared to females, but then you have some overlapping genes. When you look at these overlapping genes, for the most part, they're per going in a pretty similar direction where red is increased, um, um, you know, um, in increased gene expression, the yellow is reduced gene expression. Um, and we see that across all brain regions, except for the ventral basal thalamus, where it kind of seems to be opposite. Um, we've then gone on and done this um, more kind of global analysis of these um, gene networks. We've done this weighted gene co-expression network analysis. So this is really a systems biology method for describing uh, correlation patterns among molecules across gene expression or proteomic samples. And it basically allows you to group um, genes into modules based on um, co these correlation patterns. And you get these modules of genes um, with these hub genes. And these genes don't have to be, they're related by their you know, correlation patterns. Um, and they don't have to be re related by biological processes. But what you can do um, is start to um, find biological processes within these network modules. And these modules are kind of equivalent to, if you think about flight patterns, where you have all these connections across different cities and you have these hub airports, which are kind of like the key drivers, the main drivers of these, 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 of these modules and these hub genes here are kind of the main drivers. Um, so we've done this analysis and this has been done with um, Setha Ment and Mahashwada Bazu in his lab, um, a bioinformatician. And then the downstream analysis has been done by Jimmy Lasak in the lab. And what we found, I'm just focusing on the reward brain regions is we do get these different modules here, just showing they're here they're color coded. We've also labeled them by numbers. Um, you can see these outer three modules or outer three um, 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 areas here are nucleus accumbens. Um, sorry, I left out the uh, what, what these are. This is actually this top one is male, female, and then combined. Um, and then the next are the pre PRL, the PFC, again, male, female, combined. Um, and then VTA male female combined, and then the p value again, um, the same same order, the male female combined. And interesting, what we're kind of seeing is if you look at um, um, the nucleus accumbens one, so this outer layer here, we're actually seeing here's the male, here's the female. We're kind of seeing opposite changes in these modules in males versus females. 
uh, for the um, PR prelimbic and the VTA, we're actually finding um, there these these changes are pretty consistent across sexes. And then you also see them when you this is this is the um, um, this is both groups, both male and female together. Um, interesting, we're also seeing some opposite changes as uh, module nine and ten. This is um, between PRL and um, VTA. Um, um, so those are kind of some global changes. But we've done it in terms of mitochondria is we start to go in and look. Um, we've looked at genontology terms in these different modules. And um, we find a number of um, genontologies and things we're really interested in looking at, but we found some related to mitochondrial organization. This is Nicholas and Cummins. This is in module one, eight, and 16, where we're seeing things like mitochondrial um, organization, apoptotic mitochondrial changes, oxidative phosphorylation, um, mitoprotein complex in your membrane, and um, um, NAD. H the hydrogenase activity. So we can start to go and explore these changes more. And just to kind of orient you, this is the enrichment score. This is how enriched these geontology terms are. So for instance, oxidative phosphorylation is quite enriched, um, as well as mitochondrial protein complex. And this is the number of genes. Um, and then this is the um, log p fold change, um, p value. Um, and then if you look at the prelimbic, you see that there are mitochondrial related um, um, ontology terms in module nine and 10. Um, this is mitochondrial organization. And then in the VTA, also in module nine and 10, um, and this has to do with um, protein complex and ATP um, synthase complex. Um, and again, these are the two modules that are that seem to be opposite re related, regulated VTA versus PRL. So that's really a starting point for us to just look at mitochondria. Uh, we're also, again, interested in upstream transcriptional regulators, and we can do this um, through this analysis. We use irregular cytoscape. And we found a couple in the nucleus cummins, we found a couple of transcriptional um, molecules, um, ESRRA and um, GAP PB1. Um, ESRRA actually interacts with PGC1 alpha, which is a molecule I talked about previously that we found change in cocaine. And here's just um, downstream molecules, um, potential downstream targets of um, ESRRA as well as GAP, GAB, um, P BP1. Um, so, you know, we see some molecules like mitochondrial import receptors. Um, we also saw this is a D DNM1, it's played, it plays a role in mitochondrial fission. So this is a way we can further explore mitochondrial properties. So finally, last two slides. Um, I also want to um, talk about, briefly talk about peripheral mitochondria. This is something that people are starting to look at. Um, um, researchers have showed, including in, and especially in clinical populations, that there can be a change in peripheral um, mitochondria in stressful situ situations that lead to um, changes in the immune system, endocrine system. Um, and you could see changes at the level of mitochondrial DNA copy number um, in, you know, in, oops, in a number of disorders, um, including um, things like early life stress or psychiatric disorders. You could also see there's also um, mitochondria um, DNA free that's free floating in the blood and the people see changes in this. Um, usually in the, the copy number, it's gonna be in the leukocytes. There's actually no mitochondria in um, red blood cells. Um, so, so researchers have begun to profile the mitochondria in the blood in um, um, you know, a number of clinical conditions, including psychiatric disease. And there's some data suggesting that mitochondrial peripheral, um, mitochondria, peripheral um, mitochondrial DNA copy number that is associated, an increase in associated with early life stress and lifetime psychopathology, including depressive anxiety and substance use disorders, um, also been found in major depressive disorder, anxiety, SUDs. Um, bipolar disorder. Um, but then there are some situations where we see a reduction. Um, for instance, in combat veterans, they found a reduction in mitochondrial DNA copy number in granulocytes. sites. And one thing um, why, why you might be seeing differences, sometimes an increase, sometimes a decrease, sometimes no change, is because you know, it, it really depends on how you're profiling the blood. Um, you can, like some of these cases, they're just taking the whole blood. Um, other cases, they're isolating um, the leukocytes you know, granulocytes. So, so you can have, you know, differences based on the, you know, based on how you're profiling the blood, especially when you're taking whole blood, you're just getting a mixture of different cells and you're potentially getting these free floating mitochondria. 
So collecting blood in animal samples when you're, you know, when you're taking the animal to brain tissue, it's pretty easy. So we've done that across a variety of conditions. So this is some data where Callie Calarco has been collecting um, the blood from these adolescent mice and the perinatal fentanyl mice. Um, and interesting what she's seeing, and I'll just say she's looking at um, the total blood. So again, this is all the blood cells. It can also um, include um, free floating mitochondrial DNA. But what she's finding in the males is there is this reduction in um, this um, peripheral mitochondrial DNA copy number and really no difference in the females, although it kind of looks like there might be some individual differences here. Um, another thing she's doing is just going in and profiling different mitochondrial um, related genes um, and comparing it to this blood mitochondrial copy number. So here's an example where she's looked at MFN1, which is a mitochondrial fusion um, um, molecule. And she does see a correlation where um, animals with higher MFN1 in the accumbens actually have lower blood mitochondrial copy number. So there's a, this is the way we're trying to explore the mitochondria um, in the, um, the blood. And potentially we could start to look to see is this, you know, what, what cell type is happening in the blood? Does this play a some role in, you know, nerve or an immune response to the blood? And ultimately, how does that relate to the brain? Um, so I hope I've shown you that, you know, we are seeing these mitochondrial adaptations with these drug exposure. Um, we do see mitochondrial DRP1 fission is enhanced in these D1 neurons um, um, with um, cocaine exposure. And we have some indication that regulates plasticity. We're also seeing mitochondrial related molecules and potential transcriptional regulators are altered in cocaine exposed adults and perinatal fentanyl exposed adolescents across brain reward regions. And then we are, we do, we are starting to see these findings where we see this reduced peripheral mitochondrial DNA copy number, at least in these perinatal fentanyl exposed mice. So I would show you that mitochondrial are important to look at. They're just, you know, one other piece of the puzzle as they're trying to understand neurobiological mechanisms of substance use disorders. Um, potentially they're playing a role in um, um, synaptic plasticity, structural plasticity, but possibly other factors. Um, and we're excited to pursue them and, um, and we will continue to pursue them in the lab. Um, and again, I just want to thank, the, finally, I want to thank the people in the lab that contributed to the project, Ramesh Chandra, Michelle Engel, Shannon Cole, Meg Fox, Jamil Osaka, and Kelly Kalarko, um, and all of our collaborators here, and all of my funding sources. And here's the lab before COVID, and this is you know, how, how we've been actor, interacting these days. So thank you, for, um, thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Mary Kay. Maybe um, if you could stop sharing your screen, we'll, we'll take yeah. um, uh, questions. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we do have one question, Sema. I don't know if you want to uh, lead the question and answer period. If not, I can do it. I can do it. Um, Great. Thanks, Marina. Uh, so Ridwika, sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, wanted to know what you think it could be the reason for EGR3 neurons behaving contradictorily in female rats and mice as compared to males when cocaine was introduced? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I, I don't have a great answer to that. I mean, it's, you know, I think we need to really go and explore these downstream changes. It are, is, is, you know, this change in EGR3, is it, um, you know, this reduction in EGR3, is that leading to a change in downstream transcriptional targets and cellular processes? So I think we need to really explore the downstream mechanisms to better understand that. We do know that there are sex differences in responses to cocaine. EGR3 is a potential mechanism, but I think we just need to further try and understand what's, what's happening downstream in these GT neurons to get a better, better understanding of what underlies those differences. Uh, Mary Kay, if you don't mind, I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So uh, great talk. Um, I was really struck by how different the transcriptomes and transcriptional regulators were across brain areas. And I would have yeah. thought there might be a core core com yeah. feeling for, for whether um, um, drugs of a, of a, uh, or addictive drugs um, see just be regulated, it's there, and then you add this on, or if there's something else. 
Yeah. So sorry, you were going in and out, but I think your <laughs> your general question is why why are we seeing um, from what I gather going on why are we seeing these different changes throughout the different brain regions and what wouldn't we expect similar mechanisms? And yeah, that's that's a good question. I would expect yeah potential similar transcriptional mechanisms. Um, and again, I don't I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I think. Um, one, we have to really go in, I mean, this is just transcriptome data or NASIC data, we have to go in and really look at these mechanisms in detail and grow and invalidate these mechanisms. Um, and maybe when we're, you know, maybe we'll see differences and we profiling different types of cells. Like I mentioned, we really go in and look at these glutamatergic inputs, nucleus accumbens, maybe we'll see similar changes across glutamatergic regions very, compared to GABAergic regions. Um, um, and other other or GABAergic cells and other other cell types. So so maybe when we go in and look at the cell subtypes, we'll we'll potentially find some similar mechanisms across similar cell subtypes. But it, it's hard to say because all this tissue was um, all this sequencing was from you know global tissue, which is both neurons and non neuronal cells. Um, so I think going in and looking at um, these specific cell subtypes will give us a better idea, hopefully. Yeah. Sorry about my internet there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question in the chat. Um, so Kate Reisner says, wonderful talk. Given that EGR3 and DRP1 are influenced by cocaine in opposite directions, do you hypothesize increased mitochondrial fusion in the nucleus accumbens uh, D2 neurons or impaired neural fission? Yeah, so so that's a good question. We actually have looked at them. I didn't show the data, but in that, that DRP1 paper, we looked at all the mitofusion molecules and other fission molecules um, in both neurons, and we didn't really see much of a cell type system specific change in these, um, you know, these other molecules. We also looked at mitochondria in the D2 neurons said that after cocaine self-administration at early abstinent time point. And we don't, we did see like a slight change in like one region of the um, dendrites in larger um, mitochondria. Um, but we, went, we weren't really seeing anything more than that. So potentially because we saw that slight change, there is some mitofusion processes going on there. But again, we didn't see the molecular changes. Um, um, so I think, um, but, but there's pro pro possibly other mechanisms at play. So I'll also say that we manipulated DRP1 in the D2 neurons and didn't get any behavioral changes. So at least manipulating fission didn't have any effect in those neurons. Um, so, um, but, but I mean, you know, there are potentially other mitochondrial mechanisms going on in the D2 neurons and, and we're still looking at it. And again, looking at this prolonged time point, are there, are there changes there? We don't see changes in the D1 neurons and mitochondria, at least the morphology at, at this early time point, but we have, at this long-term time point, but we haven't looked at the D2 neurons. So, so I think we just need to do further investigation. Well, thank you very much. That brings us to the okay. end of the hour. Uh, really appreciate your, your excellent talk and your time. Uh, and thank you everyone for participating. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. bye.